Warning, this review contains content that may not be suitable for children. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, my bullet scavenging friends. Arlo here, and today we're reviewing... The Resident Evil Revelations collection for the Nintendo Switch. This collection includes two games, so I'll be covering each individually before tackling the collection as a whole. So, will these be cool games that have zombies in them, or will they not? Hey, give me a break here. I've done like a million reviews this month. I don't have time to come up with a thing for this one. Resident Evil Revelations was, for a time, a 3DS exclusive, and let me tell you, I played that game so much. I mean, according to my play log, I played the demo just over and over again for six hours until I finally got the full game, and I played that for over a hundred! The modern Resident Evil style of gameplay is just so much fun for me that when I got it in handheld form, I couldn't put it down. So naturally, I was excited to see how the game holds up on a beefier console. The biggest question in my mind was, did I enjoy Revelation so much just because it was Resident Evil on the go, or was it a good game in its own right? And the answer is that it's a bit of a mix of both. It does a lot of things well, and it's still really fun to play, though in some ways it is held back a little by its handheld origins. Revelations primarily follows Jill and Parker as they navigate an abandoned cruise ship searching for their missing BSAA partners and trying to get to the bottom of what turns out to be a great big zombie mess. There's a new virus in town, and not just happy turning people into monsters, it's turning them into grossy goop monsters. The game is told in episodes, and often puts you in the shoes of a number of other characters in other times and places in order to tell more of the story. It plays out much like a TV show, with previously on Resident Evil Revelations recaps before each chapter, and I kinda like the jump around episodic thing, and I kinda don't. On the plus side, it does help keep things fresh. There are only so many different locales you can expect to explore on a cruise ship, so I could see an entire game from Jill and Parker's perspective feeling a little plain. It's fun to stretch your legs, so to speak, and fight some different kinds of B.O.W.s in different places, letting loose and just trying to get through the mission without worrying about finding big secrets and conserving your ammo, which is reserved for the main game. And I really do like learning more about what's going on by seeing it for myself rather than just hearing or reading about it. On the other hand, though, it kind of breaks immersion, especially with the whole TV thing. Sometimes I don't want to be pulled out of the cruise ship and plunked down somewhere else. And to be honest, the story isn't the most engaging. I mean, it's okay. It's certainly not bad, but it falls into the trap that made Resident Evil 6 a mess. Politics, organizations, espionage, globetrotting, action-adventure, intrigue. Resident Evil stories are better when they're smaller and more personal. When you know all that stuff is going on in the background, but in the here and now, your goal is to survive and kill the main bad guy. The bigger picture stuff eliminates a lot of the scare factor. And oh boy, don't get me started on the characters. Revelations has got some of the most horrendously annoying characters you'll find in a game, spouting badly written, then badly translated dialogue left and right. It's a double whammy of awful. Get ready to move. Uh, I hate snow. Snow hates you. Fortunately, Jill and Parker are tolerable because, like I said, we spend most of the game with them. Now, the game's format might kill some of the scary potential, but there's still a good amount left in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The goop guys often just stand around waiting for you to come by, but they also have a tendency to randomly pop out of furniture and air ducts, leading to a constant feeling of unease. Lying in my bed with the lights off, this game has made me jump and or give a tiny startled shout more times than I'd like to admit. Then if you thought the devs would skimp in the action department just because this was a handheld game, you thought wrong. This game can be really challenging and it demands a lot from you. These guys right here, the weakest, most common enemy, sometimes you'll unload an entire clip into them before they go down. Naturally, headshots will get the job done faster, though good luck with that because they bob and weave around all over the places they're coming after you. This leads to some really intense, really claustrophobic situations in smaller areas. That ain't the end of it though. Revelations has still got your bigger places with your loads and loads of enemies and your shooting everything in sight arena style. It does a really good job of mixing slow and fast paced action. There's plenty of that close and personal RE1 stuff and plenty of that guns blazing RE5 stuff. Control wise, they've done a pretty good job of overcoming the limitations of the original. Having a second stick means you can control it just like any other third person shooter, which certainly beats the somewhat sluggish scheme on the 3DS. 
If there's one 3DS remnant that should have been addressed though, it's item switching. Up and down on the D-pad cycle through grenades and left and right cycle through guns. Without the ability to assign each thing to a hotkey, switching in the middle of combat can be frustrating. When something's coming at me, I need to be able to switch to my shotgun in a split second, but especially if I'm changing my loadout between encounters, I'm never going to remember how many presses it'll take for me to get from one specific gun to another. This often leads to a lot of fumbling and taking spiky goop claws to the face. One very fun thing is that you explore the cruise ship adventure style versus traveling more or less in a straight line like in most other modern Resident Evils. You hunt down keys and such in order to progress and you can backtrack to find secrets if you're a good mental note taker and even old areas can surprise you with newly spawning goop dudes just to keep you nervous. It's all pretty linear. You're pretty much going to find everything in a certain order unless you do some glitchy sequence breaking I don't know about. And sometimes you might find yourself running back and forth on a wild goose chase that wastes time because you got confused about something on the map. But overall, I love this style of progression. It's what made me love 7 so much and it's the reason everyone tells me I should probably play 1 or the remake of 1 or the remaster of the remake of 1. Quite interestingly, Revelations introduces the ability to scan your environment. You'll find hidden items all over the place and on top of that, you can scan goop guys to earn extra herbs. In side missions where you're moving in a straight path, it's a little annoying to constantly be scanning everything you see as it really slows down gameplay. On the cruise ship though, it's a lot more satisfying because once you've scanned an area, you've scanned it, so you feel more like you're getting somewhere by checking each room off your list. Scanning every goopy corpse you create also slows things down, which is a little lame, but doing it is purely optional. Plus, if you're in a bad situation and in desperate need of an herb, trying to scan the dudes coming after you is delightfully intense. In addition to ammo and herbs and grenades, you'll find new guns throughout your adventure, naturally, though this time, instead of just paying to upgrade them, you find custom parts that you can use to augment them. There are tons of different parts to find and choose from, and you can swap them out whenever you find a weapon case. Higher power, greater chance to stun, quicker reload, damage boost at a certain distance from the enemy, all this stuff that makes your guns beefier and sometimes even changes up your strategy. The graphics were without a doubt the most impressive thing about the original. The game looked stupidly good for a 3DS game. So good in fact that here it looks like basically all they've done is up everything. All the character models and animations are the same, all the environments are the same, they're just rendered at a significantly higher resolution, and that really says a lot about the 3DS version. None of it will blow you away visually, but it's all very pleasant. The goop monsters are particularly fun to look at, and the cruise ship is just dripping with atmosphere thanks to the excellent use of lighting. The dim grunginess of the once resplendent common areas and the dark abandoned halls running behind them. Lastly, we come to raid mode, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is why I racked up so many hours in the original. Original. Raid mode is an extra, more action-heavy arcadey mode similar to the Mercenaries mode found in RE's 3 through 6 and the full Mercenaries spin-off also on 3DS. The difference though is that this mode is fun. <laughs> no, see, I I'm just not a big fan of being timed in anything, really. Do as much as you can and try to get a high score before time runs out is just not fun for me. It's stressful. That's why, despite my love for Pikmin, challenge mode is a huge disappointment, as an example. Raid mode, though, is about killing guys and getting to your goal. And it's funny because that's not normally the sort of gameplay I like, but I love it for the same reason I so badly wanted Resident Evil in handheld form. I just love the core gameplay so much that I relish having a mode that gives me such a great reason to just keep playing and playing. To reference Pikmin again, that's why I'm so obsessed with the idea of having a Pikmin level editor, so I've just got that much more Pikmin to play all the time. It gets so much better though. Raid Mode's levels are stretched across areas of the main game, 20 in all plus one really long bonus level. There are multiple difficulty settings to master and ranks and medals to earn on everything. You can play as different characters and they all have bonuses to certain weapons. Within each level you'll find baddies from all over the main game, and you'll often find elite versions which can be small and fast, or big and slow and extra powerful. This creates a really excellent sense of constant danger. You just never know what terrifyingly wacky bunch of guys the game will have you kill next. It could be a giant version of an already giant boss. It could be three tiny versions of a different boss and they're all trapped in a small room with you. You've got to be prepared for anything and everything and completing some of these missions make you want to roar in triumph like a Neanderthal standing over the tiger it just killed with its bare hands. Even more, you gain XP and level up and your level compared to an enemy's will determine how much damage is given and taken. You find weapons and custom parts all over the place and you find better, higher level versions of all of them the more you play. You also earn money, which you can use to buy guns and parts and storage upgrades. The entire thing is immensely addictive, and the draw to play just one more level is very strong. And of course, in that level, when an enemy drops a part you wanted, you'll want to give it a test drive to see how much better it makes your gun, which leads to another level and more drops. And before you know it, you've played 15 levels and it's 2 in the morning. All in all, considering it was once a 
3DS title, Resident Evil Revelations is an impressive and very fun game. But before we get into all the conclusion y wrap up stuff, let's move on to Revelations 2. The game isn't exactly a direct sequel to Revelations 1, at least not any more than any Resident Evil title that comes after a previous one. Uh, they all tie together, and it does reference some stuff in Revelations 1, but it also references stuff in the other games. Once again, things are split into chapters, though this time we follow two groups of characters equally, and they alternate. In addition to a last time on Revelations 2, we now get a next time on Revelations 2, and I understand this was done because the game was originally released in bits and you could buy the chapters individually, but now that the whole package is together like this, it's pretty annoying. During my playthrough, I was always like, what? No, d don't show me what happens and fumbling for the skip button. So the whole game takes place on one island, and this is a welcome change from Revelations 1, which I mentioned broke the immersion a good amount by jumping around the world. In one half, you play as Claire and her friend Moira, who were captured by a bunch of Mysterio SWAT spooks and taken to some equally Mysterio and spooktastic facility. They've got to find a way out of this situation and figure out the identity and intentions of a person they know only as the Overseer, who keeps yakking at them through speakers and stuff. In the other half, you play as Barry, Moira's dad, who came to the island to find and rescue his daughter, and he's back backed up by Natalia, a little girl he finds when he gets there. This whole back and forth chapter mechanic is a little clever and a little annoying. And uh, actually, now that I think about it, you could use a little clever and a little annoying to describe a lot of the game's concepts. Barry and Natalia are always following behind Claire and Moira, so they go through a lot of the same areas. They do see lots of unique stuff, but sometimes treading the same path can be somewhat tedious. It, it kind of feels cheap. There are a few things that are different the second time through, and there are certain enemies in Claire's game that will leave behind landmine kinds of things that Barry has to watch out for, but that's really the extent of it. The idea of one character following behind another isn't explored to a very satisfying degree. I could easily see the guys behind Resident Evil coming up with all sorts of interesting things here. Different scenarios for Claire to encounter that change what kinds of monsters Barry will fight and what items he can find. What if she could weaken a big enemy for him or unwittingly let one out or leave behind weapons for him? But nah, there's really none of that. They just kind of recycle locales. And in that same vein, some places are stretched to their limits in an effort to pad out the experience. When a game is designed well, you can spend a lot of time in one place and still feel like you're making progress. Like, of course, the cruise ship in Revelations 1 or the houses in Ares 1 and 7. When done right, this decreases development time but still offers satisfying adventure-style gameplay. Revelations 2 is mostly linear in its progression, but every once in a while, it'll keep you stuck in one place, running back and forth and accomplishing tasks that I normally wouldn't exactly call puzzles. These parts aren't particularly well designed, they just feel like busy work and they kind of break the game's pacing. The partner system, again, kind of interesting, kind of meh. You can switch control to Moira or Natalia at any time and they function very similarly and serve a lot of the same purposes. Moira's flashlight can uncover hidden items and she's got to focus the beam on them in order to render them pick upable. Unfortunately, her holding the flashlight means that when you're playing as Claire, you'll often be staring into a dark corner, waiting for Moira to catch up or to realize that you're trying to look at something. Moira's also got a crowbar, which she can use to open boarded up doors and special Moira-only chests, and she uses that as her weapon. Natalia can see hidden items without having to shine a light on them, though she still has to point at them. She can also see zombies through walls and spot their weaknesses, so Barry doesn't have to go into a situation blind. As for weapons, there are bricks lying around basically everywhere, weirdly enough, and she can whack guys with them or chuck them. Switching back and forth between characters is kind of annoying. I enjoyed scanning for items in Revelations 1 because, like I said, it's got a big central location that you spend a lot of time in, and once you've scanned something, it's scanned as long as you pick it up. Also, it's mapped to a button, so just boom, there you go, you're scanning. Here, with linear levels, switching characters, and perspectives to give the area a quick sweep every single time you turn a new corner or walk 10 steps is tedious and does more to break the pacing. Fortunately, since Moira follows you with her light, at least as best she can, you can often spot them without having to switch to her first, and Natalia can see them at any distance, so I just spend most of my time as her until I hit guys to fight. Both partners can hold items, which is nice until you realize they're nothing more than glorified pack mules. They can hold healing items and use them automatically when you need them, so that can be helpful, but that's about it. You'll spend a lot of very not fun time managing items between characters. Sometimes partners break off to get into spaces the main characters can't, though it's usually no more than mere moments before they manage to unlock a door or whatever and reunite with the mains. It's like the developers knew that it would be too stressful and annoying if you had to spend too much time being that helpless, so they chickened out and barely utilized the idea. But that begs the question, was it worth using the mechanic in the first place? I don't know, to its credit, there are at least a few sequences where switching back and forth is done in an interesting way, and for mostly helpless AI characters, they're pretty alright at staying out of trouble, especially with auto-regenerating health. 
but they just don't feel like they enhance the gameplay. They feel more like a crutch that you're forced to lean on. Biggest issue with them though, is that they effectively wipe away a lot of the game's scare factor. I'll tell you right now, Revelations 2 has a few of the spoopiest locales I've seen in an RE game. The first one, which is essentially an insane torture hospital, is just excellent. Very scary stuff. But you know what's not scary? A 20 year old yammering in your ear and spouting try hard, supposed to be funny exclamations. I mean, what in a Stop moist talking. barrel of <sighs> There is positively no feeling of isolation and fear when you're paired up with someone who was a teenager six seconds ago. Things could have potentially been better with Barry, as Natalia is quiet and straight laced, but oh yeah, she can see all the monsters around you at all times, so nothing will ever surprise you. So what you get here is a game that could have been plenty scary, but is just sort of whatever. There are some scary looking monsters, but I never felt that fun kind of video game fear. It seems like the developers went to great lengths to make sure that didn't happen. So yet another kind of interesting kind of not thing is that the game introduces a stealth element. If you sneak up on an enemy, you can kill them in one move, and this is the main reason Natalia was given the ability to help you get a beat on the guys around you. This also wasn't explored very well and feels kind of tacked on. Survival horror is all about feeling helpless, or at least very vulnerable, and this undermines that idea. Plus, the system is just kind of wonky. It's pretty obvious that stealth is new to the RE team. I was very pleased to see that they brought back treasure collecting, and this time around, you can use your money to upgrade your <gasps> skill tree. Arlo loves skill trees. Yet again, this falls a little flat. Treasure just kind of lies around everywhere for free instead of consistently rewarding you for thorough exploration or beating optional enemies. There's a little of that exploration thing, but nothing like in other RE games. Then the skill tree is pretty underwhelming. I think they didn't want to unbalance the game or something because most of the skills offer such tiny bonuses or require playing in an unfun way to utilize. Damage boost while crouching? I don't want to remember to crouch all the time, that's stupid. Extra damage right after switching guns or switching between characters? Yeah, swapping back and forth all the time is a fun way to get some extra good hits in. Switch, boom, switch, switch, boom, switch, boom, no. Then lots of the skills improve your partner's ability to fight, but I never felt compelled to use them in that way. It was just too much of a pain. I'd rather just shoot guys myself. So I know I have a lot of eh things to say about Revelation 2's campaign, but that isn't to say it's not enjoyable. It's still a Resident Evil game, and as such, there's still a ton of fun to be had. The various enemy types are pretty all right, like I said, couple were decently scary. Even if I overall didn't really like the partner mechanic, there were some good bits thrown in there. Natalia directing you where to aim your gun in order to shoot an invisible enemy is very clever. And really, if the game has one big strength, it's the story. It establishes a good weird mystery early on and by the end everything is clear, and that to me is the mark of a good story. It had me guessing and pondering the whole time. And while Moira killed the mood with her expletive-fueled dialogue, she wasn't a particularly bad character. The game had none of the horrendous character junk we saw in Revelations 1, just the usual low level of eye-rollingly bad that we're used to. Graphically, the game is pretty alright. It's a little rough around the edges and not as good looking as the other RE titles from last gen, but it's certainly an improvement over Revelations 1. There are more varied set pieces and the baddies have a lot of nice detail. Pleasant overall, I'd say. It's worth mentioning that the game comes with two bonus chapters that were originally DLC, though they're short and I wasn't super into them. One is from the perspective of Natalia and is pure stealth, and was alright for the story, but not something I would ever play again. The other follows Moira, and you've got a limited amount of time to gather resources before taking on a huge horde of enemies, and you go through this process at least twice. You have to do the whole thing in one go without saving, and you can run out of retries, so for me this was nothing but stressful, and I called it quits after it told me to gather stuff the second time. I could see some people liking this one though, it's definitely an interesting idea. Well, as you can see, Revelations 2 had some good elements and some bad ones, so in conclusion, I think I, oh wait a second, it's got a raid mode too. I'm not going to talk too much about Revelation 2's raid mode because I already talked about the other one so much and this review is running really long, but let me just say they took something amazing and made it so much amazing-er. Now you have this cool little hub room where you can buy stuff and upgrade your guns and check the leaderboards. The different characters all have tons of active and passive skills to unlock and they level up separately. You can combine parts to make better ones. The medallions are more fun to earn. There are daily challenges online. I'd say the best of all though, remember how the first raid mode gave special attributes to some baddies? Well now there are about a 
billion different monster bonuses. They can spew poison, they can heal the other monsters, they can be fiery or icy or electric-y and explode when they die, they can pull you in, the list goes on and on. And these bonuses can even stack! What we've got right here, ladies and gentlemen, is something that, if I'm not careful, will bleed a tremendous amount of time away from my life. It's bad enough that I've got Skyrim on my Switch, now I've got this nonsense calling to me at every moment of the day. If I've got one complaint about this improved raid mode though, it's about life crystals. These can be used to revive yourself when you die in a mission, and doing this won't even count against the medallion you get for not using any herbs. In the original versions, you had to earn these through daily challenges or buy them with real world money. Here you can just buy them from the store, and you'll always have enough gold to keep yourself stocked up. This essentially removes the challenge from the game. You can just continue basically forever and still get all the medallions. If you still want a challenge, you've got to just not use them, or at least not buy them from the store. Just use the ones that you earn through daily challenges, fair and square. I'm not a big fan of self-imposed limitations in games. If the option is there, I'm going to be tempted to use it. But in this case, the mode is fun enough that I just do my best to ignore the feature and do it all legit style. I mean, I have to. It's too good to be ruined by this one thing, so I just make it work. So now that we've covered both games, I've got a few points where I thought I would group them together. Performance in Revelations 1 is pretty darn smooth, seeing as it was originally built to run on a 3DS. There are certainly drops, but most of the time things are great. Performance in Revelations 2, on the other hand, is pretty inconsistent. It never runs so slow that it's distracting to me. What's distracting is that inconsistency. I think I would prefer it if the game was capped at 30 FPS so that dips down into the 20s were less noticeable. But when it bounces up to 60, then down to 25, then up to somewhere in between and back up to 60 again, it's a little jarring. Not a huge deal, but you know, it's a little deal. Worse in Revelations 2 though are the load times. They can be, uh... Pretty rough. Starting a chapter can take upwards of a minute, and it can be a bummer waiting for your raid to start. Once again, not a deal breaker, but definitely something worth noting. As far as switchiness goes, the game seems to run equally well in both docked and handheld modes, and the resolution is perfect all around. The game looks crisp and clear and beautiful on the Switch's screen. If I have one complaint about the way the game's displayed, it's that there's this weird film grain effect in darker areas. I don't know if this was to emulate the look of film or something, but it looks pretty gross. Fortunately, it's the sort of thing I can get used to if I just don't think about it too much. Sound design is stellar, as always in RE games. The music is nice and atmospheric, sound effects are top-notch, and two in particular has some fun and scary enemy sounds. One thing that Resident Evil has always excelled at is set design. And these two games are no different. Environments look so real, with crazy attention given to the tiniest details. Very few game series out there make their worlds look so legitimately lived in, and that heightens the creepy factor considerably. Next, I was all about gyro aiming in the original. In fact, it was quite literally the only thing that made the game playable for me. Trying to line up precise shots with a circle pad was impossible, and there was no way to move and aim at the same time unless you had a circle pad pro. Remember how that was a thing, by the way? Wow. Here, gyro aiming is so close to being the best possible way to play. It would be the closest thing to a mouse and keyboard this side of a mouse and keyboard. And when it works, it allows me to aim with speed and accuracy entirely unmatched by the control stick. But the problem is with the technology itself. It drifts. It just kind of wiggles around sometimes. Sometimes it works great, and other times it keeps dragging you one way or the other. This was the case on the 3DS as well, but I didn't mind as much because it was still loads better than using the circle pad. Here though, it's a harder sell. There are times when it throws me off so much that I just can't really rely on it as a feature. It's disappointing, but unfortunately the tech just ain't there yet, at least not with a game that requires such precise aiming. In terms of multiplayer, I didn't have a chance to try it out a lot, but I know you can have a friend play as Moira or Natalia. This is a nice touch, but only if you've got a friend who wants to play, but doesn't really want to play. <laughs> they just kinda wanna help out without needing to do a lot. Then both raid modes can be played co-op style with multiple systems, and the second one lets you go online and find a person to blast zombies with, which is a great option to have. I don't have footage of it, but I did try out split screen and it ran just as well as it does in single player. And if you think raid mode is addictive alone, just try bringing a friend into the mix. You'll never, ever want to stop. Two more things. One, the Resident Evil guys need to learn how to give their female leads personalities. Jill is maybe a tiny bit better than Claire, but both are just blank slabs of human. Beyond woman, they have nothing to them. No quirks, no motivations, no anything. Supporting characters, plenty of personality, even the female ones, but not these two. They're just nothing. Two, if you get both games, don't play them too close together because all the buttons are different between them. 
I, I mean like almost every single action is mapped to a different button and playing them back to back is confusing as heck. All in all, Revelations 1 and 2 are both solid entries in the franchise and they each have their strengths and weaknesses. It's actually a little hard to rate the collection because there are so many things to consider. One has a more consistently engaging campaign and a less linear structure, but two has a better story, better overall production values, and a better raid mode. If you look at them individually, two is easily worth the price of admission. I mean, they could sell the raid mode all by itself and it would still be worth 20 bucks. One would be worth it for the same reason, if two didn't also exist. If you got a lot of time, you could tackle them both separately, but now that I've got the raid mode from two, one isn't quite worth it anymore, making the title just less valuable. I don't know, really, they've both probably got enough content to justify the price, and you can pick them up separately for 20 bucks each, or as a physical collection for 40, though I'll note that one comes on the card and two is just a download code, so it's not purely physical. They may not be perfect, but if you're a fan of the series, you really can't go wrong, especially if raid mode sounds like something you're into. I give the Resident Evil Revelations collection a 6 out of 7. Before we go, it's time for an Arlo Direct. Two things. One, I just wanted to remind you all one last time that I'll be at Sat Gamers Expo in December, so if you live in NorCal, I'd love to see you. Secondly, ha, you've been bamboozled again. Yet another video, a review no less, that is most definitely not my review of Super Mario Odyssey. Things just keep coming up. People just keep sending me review codes. But at the time of this recording though, the review is next on my list. Unless some other thing comes up, which I doubt because all the games that I wanted to play were in November, Mario will be the next video of mine that you you see. So thanks for your patience and see you then. Unless, you know, something comes up. I don't think it will. But it might. But probably not. But maybe.